Well, we have a Greek word for it, excellence. It's called aristia. I will write it down for you because I don't think it says much the way I speak it. Now, it's called aristia. I'm sure it rings a bell because I'm also sure that it's not all Greek for you. Does it ring a bell? Let me help you a bit. The first two syllables, arist. There you go. We need to change the paradigm. Six simple words. Are we looking at developing aristocracy in higher education? And if we do, how are we going to do it? What is the way towards that direction, towards building the aristocracy of higher education? Is it by organizing lists of name and shame, like the ones being published in the United States or wherever? Uh, I think we need to change the paradigm, and I think Europe has, I still believe that, the potential to change the paradigm. Why? Because diversity has always been there, and this is our best advantage ever. Okay? Uh, Europe has been the most diverse um, continent, definitely more diverse than the US, or Australia, or Canada, but we seem to forget that occasionally. Okay? So, um, what I'm going to present, um, and of course support Emmanuel's um, uh, position to excellence, relates more to our role as researchers in higher education, but also as teachers. Okay? So, for those of you who think that um, I am against excellence, you're wrong. Okay? I'm very fond of excellence, but um, we need to recontextualize it. We need to create a new meaning out of it. And of course, this asks for two major things. One is commitment, what we're committed to. Two, deep and critical reflection to what excellence really means. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to focus <coughs> on five issues. The last one is more like my own reflection towards what I do as a researcher in a higher education institution. Um, the first four issues is cultural diversity as a challenge in European higher education. The second is the research landscape. The third is the um, language matters. And of course the fourth is transference to practice. What good is research if we don't um, have a place to transfer it to. Now, um, because I heard a lot about the migrants and the refugees and the problem of the refugees and the problem of the migrants, okay, refugees and migrants are not a problem. Okay, if we agree that uh, these people are a problem, then we treat them as a problem, but they're not. Um, we need to change a bit the language there. Now, the teaching and learning environment perspectives uh, appear a lot in policy documents, in legal documents that uh, relate to issues of embracing diversity in higher education in Europe, but there's still a huge gap between uh, what's really happening and what uh, the rhetoric, the policy rhetoric is. Okay? I think this is a key word here. Okay. Coexistence. And of course, cultural diversity is not simply about people with different ethnic background. It's so many things. Things we know, but also things we don't know. Things that are visible and things that are less visible. So diversity eventually means many different things. And um, the first thing we need to do in order to understand diversity is to find these meanings to find what it actually means in a certain context. Higher education, again, is, um, is an area 
in which many things takes place. It's teaching, it's research, it's socializing. So we need to find and make meaning of diversity in these different contexts. Diversity in teaching, diversity in research, diversity in socializing within higher education environments, etc. Difference eventually becomes, as I say, a means for students to develop more marketable skills nowadays. Okay? Increase institutional revenues, as Emmanuel has already suggested. But this is not about exploiting people's diversity. Exploiting is different from embracing. At the same time, there are also fewer institutional spaces for us to sit down and discuss and contemplate and think and reflect on these issues, issues of diversity and difference within our own working environment. So we need essentially to think about, the, I, I marked in red the uh, key words, so I think it will be very easy for you to uh, go around my presentation later. We need to look at the hierarchical power of relations, okay? me, teacher, you, student, me, native, you, whatever. Um, and of course the presumption of Western epistemic university. I think we, we're still lagging behind in terms of the university we want and of course the university we actually need. Thus it remains important to ask how these are reframed. We need to reframe, make new meaning, but of course this cannot happen because some policy makers say so, or because it's been written in paper in some legal document. It asks more than that. It asks for a real deep change from the inside. Now about research. Research essentially is all about creating new knowledge, okay? but also coming into terms with that knowledge. Um, in higher education, we essentially provide people, young people, but also older people, a place where they can resolve their conflicts in a peaceful manner and learn to live with diversity on a daily basis. So we should not forget that. This is part of our research task as well. Okay? I don't know how many of us take the role of the consultant, for example, despite that of being the researcher. I identify myself as a researcher, but every week, Fridays, from uh, 4.30 until 6.30, I'm also a consultant. Okay? So I need to resolve issues that students have. I also need to resolve issues that my colleagues have, as being head of my department, for instance. Um, essentially, this asks for a safe um, knowledge-building environment, meaning a safe learning environment, meaning a safe research environment. Okay? So, we need to change the paradigm there as well. Okay? The workspace in which we operate, and of course, how we reframe the term research. Also, recent events have demonstrated that alienation, marginalization, and lack of belonging make people more susceptible to extremist views and violent actions, etc. <coughs> I think the um, first presentation from Zahra uh, was exemplary. Okay? She went through an ordeal, literally, but her story, for many of us, might sound like, you know, um, this is something that happened to you, but now you're fine, isn't it? Well, you should have been through that in the first place, okay? Um, on top of that, also, there is increasing cultural and ethnic and religious diversity, but then again, thinking about European history, it has always been there, hasn't it? This diversity, however, is not addressed effectively. And of course, if it's managed properly, then it becomes an asset. And I think this is where we should look at, manage it properly. <coughs> this is more or less the reflection from the Higher Education for You 2 project. These are um, um, six major research variables we used uh, to collect data. 
personal background variables, educational policies, cultural and political dynamics, organizational support, students' experiences, and of course, personal, institutional, and societal gains. Okay? This is what we should look at. And of course, this is one way to reframe excellence in due course, of course. It, that can, this cannot happen from one day to another. One important aspect also in research is the difficulty in defining who are the ethnic and culturally diverse minorities, who are the migrants in higher education. And of course, to me, as an academic, because I, I have been wondering when was the last time I felt that I have migrant students in my class, or I worked with migrant uh, students in research. I never had that, um, so to speak, notion of um, he or she is a migrant in my class. They're students. These are my students. And at that moment in time, of course, um, I don't need to define them as migrants, as culturally diverse, or as whatever else. The other, of course, aspect is that the analysis um, in most research uh, is based on the assumption that ethnic minorities and migrants are historically invisibly groups. Well, they can become historically invisible, but in reality they are not. If we agree with that, then of course they are invisible. Okay. So, my suggestion is that we need to collect data we need to approach all our students and collect data, okay? And of course, this way we will have a more broad view of what is considered invisible, okay? I remember in my university when I asked our secretary in the department if they keep any data of um, our students' ethnic background, they said, no, we don't do that, okay? Uh, this means that invisibility was there. But on the other hand, do I actually need that for my research at the end of the day? What kind of data do I need for my students really? Okay? These are questions, I'm not having immediate answers on that, I mean I do, but I, these are questions that we need to think first before we think of excellence in higher education. Language. Oh. This is a huge chapter, really. Okay, I mean, we all communicate in this conference in English, all right. But on the other hand, I speak my European English because I'm not a native English, okay. Emmanuel speaks his English, Zaha her English. Everybody, our own English, okay. So communication and interaction in diverse language needs to be taken into account. Okay, my English is not my English, it's the English I know, but I also speak other languages and I can express myself in different languages and of course in different ways. In the context of course of embracing diversity in higher education, the native speaker model needs to be deleted, needs to be taken out of the context because I think it causes many, many problems. I think it has already expired, it's just that we don't see it yet, okay? Uh, what matters is comprehensibility, okay? In addition to the ability to recognize that it may take some time to adapt to and understand unfamiliar accents, but we need, as I said initially, to commit to that. Commitment is the first step towards embracing diversity. So I understand Zahra when she says that yeah, you, you can't speak Finnish, or you don't speak English, or oh, your Finnish is so good. Well, what does this really mean, okay? Do you understand me or not? If you do, this is it. Again, um, although we need to um, cope, although I don't like the word to cope, with differing language levels, um, we need to accept that. Okay, we need to accept that. And as long as we comprehend our students, I think this is the most important aspect in that. I see that during my consultation routines, for example, even among native, so to speak, speakers, 
okay? Different language levels, I mean. We need to adapt to accommodate ourselves to others. This means that somehow we need to make ourselves comprehensible to others, okay? Instead of looking down on them. And of course, we also need to strengthen the focus on comprehensibility among our students, for example, but also among staff. Now, transferring all these things to practice, it's not an easy thing. Um, and I think we need to overcome certain cultural obstacles ourselves, because somehow we are bound to the way we look at ourselves in our own little nations, in our own little cultures or whatever. Okay, and we, need, we see 100,000 people, and we're talking about a continent with over 400 million people, as a threat. Okay, uh, so we need to work together and we need to rebuild a learning culture in our own institutions. This means that we need to change our role expectations and of course we need to contextualize these roles in a new dimension in our institutions. When um, there was a question earlier um, Henriette, she's not, I don't see Henriette here, she's gone, she's gone. all right, um, what um, uh, would we say to a policy maker or how would, uh, how policy maker would assist us? I would say leave us alone, we don't need you, just leave us space to breathe. Uh, policy making essentially um, creates, so to speak, a very politicized but also a very obscure um, um, space for us, okay? We need to adapt to that, but this is quite oppressive for us as well. So, um, we need to build links between language use, changing content, um, this is crucial. Uh, also, we need a more social rather than a markedly individualized model, um, uh, like output orientation or learning center. This, I will explain why this is important. Okay, I'm not against a learner-centered approach, but I'll explain later. Pedagogical sensitivity. Um, the department in which I work is called Tmima Filosofias que Pedagogikis. That's philosophy and pedagogy. And uh, when they ask me, so. What are your graduates then? I say they're pedagogues. Well, this does not necessarily resonate with the rest of the society. What does this mean? Okay. Well, this exactly means that, okay, being sensitive to others, helping them and orientating them towards emancipation. Okay. Helping them and orientating them towards uh, creating their own meaning in life and understanding what surrounds them based on that meaning, on their own codes. Positively involved and engaged also um, in terms of um, ethnic minority students, for instance, um, embedment in the teaching and learning process of the curriculum, although I don't support creating curricula everywhere, okay? But I think we need to abandon their cultural perspectives and contributions if we agree that we need a curriculum for that. Now, this is my own reflection. As I said, I'm not against um, learning-centered approaches, but I'm more into collective <coughs> approaches to learning, okay? So, four basic things, and I think we're all familiar with these things in higher education. The first one is reflective dialogue. So, we want excellence, we want aristocracy, in our institutions, we need to create this space for reflective dialogue. Interdisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity. Okay? I think the um, era of um, organizing studies based on specific scientific themes or disciplines has long gone, for me nonetheless. I think we need to move towards that direction. Participate reaction research. 
Okay. Demanding, I know, for those who perform it is extremely demanding. But it can change the whole curricular aspect. And of course, change the terminology and the language. No more university lifelong learning. I think it became already highly politicized. University solidarity approach to learning okay, means working together with our students, building knowledge together with our students. Okay. Now about reflective dialogue, I mean, it's not a lecture what I'm doing, but it's about um, strategically in the classroom building a community. Okay. This essentially asks for um, comprehensibility. Okay. It's not about knowing one specific language, uh, but understanding each other. Interdisciplinarity and cross-disciplinarity, different terms again. The first merges traditional approaches to education or concepts or methods in order to arrive at a new approach or solution. The second is collaboration between researchers working in different disciplines and with users of research. Okay? So we also need to that. Humanities is not just humanities, arts is not just arts, technology is not just technology, and science is not just science. We need to see this you know, as one thing now. Participatory action research. Okay. I know this is extremely demanding. I perform it myself. Um, in my department, we tend more and more to leave uh, curriculum development aside and look at specific focused interventions on certain issues that arise during the learning and educational process instead of organizing a curriculum and build it based on modules or whatever. Um, professional social researchers operate as full collaborators with members of organizations in studying and transforming those organizations, namely our universities. And of course developing practical knowing in the pursuit of worthwhile human purposes is the target of that type of research. Last but not least, University solidarity approach to learning instead of university lifelong learning. Solidarity puts the social into higher education. Okay. Um, learning stems from a commitment, as I initially said, to our personal development. And of course, respect and understanding of the other is paramount in this respect. Okay. So we want aristia, we want excellence, we want some kind of aristocracy. These, at least, are my own reflections or views towards that. I am closing with um, um, an excerpt for, from an interview, because we interviewed students during the um, project. Um, well, yeah, it's a she. Uh, she said that life is about relationships. Okay? And of course, being in education, you create relationships. So the teaching community is important to learning. I think there is, in that community, accountability. The students and the teachers know one another, know their strengths and weaknesses, so they begin to care about each other as persons. Okay? In ancient Greece, an aristocrat would do exactly that, and that's why they would be aristi, the best among others, uh, meaning that um, they tend to know each other, they help each other, but they are also accountable. Uh, hopefully, students and teachers are developing some deep relationships over time, and that when life happens, maybe they can step in and support and encourage. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you also, Emmanuel, because uh, you were an inspiration to me. Uh, I do hope that you understood my rationale and, of course, the way I reflected through what we did in the project. Thank you very much indeed.